Hello and welcome to the Counterweight Podcast, where we talk about how we can strive for a world in which freedom and reason are at the forefront of all human society. In this week's podcast, I have Eric Smith as a guest co-host. We speak with Ildi Tillman. Ildi is a writer, photographer, an immigrant from Hungary, and a professor of Africana Studies at SUNY Stonebrook. She shares with us both her challenges and triumphs in her journey through the unexpected politics of her chosen field. Join us. Welcome to the Counterweight Podcast. Today, I've, it's a special day because I've got Eric Smith as my co-host. Eric, welcome to the first time being my co-host on this podcast. Uh, ex- excited about that. <laughs> and we have Ildi Tillman with us. Ildi You've got such an interesting story. I really want you to start at the beginning. You uh, immigrated to the U.S. from Hungary. You are an artist. You are a photographer. A lot of your art uh, you've done in Haiti. But also what's really interesting and where you and I connected is you came here. You became interested in Africana Studies. You also teach at SUNY courses in Africana Studies. So start at the beginning. Start with your journey from Hungary to the United States. Okay, so I'll start with that. So um, maybe I will start just a tiny little step before that. So what, Please. you know, just, just a sentence about me when I was still living in Hungary. Um, so I went to law school in Hungary. I have a law degree from Hungary. But um, through like third year of law school, I realized that's not really what I wanted to do. And then I spent a year in Israel outside of my studies, not related to my studies, but but I considered that year in Israel and the experiences that I had in Israel, the language, how I learned to speak Hebrew, a very important part of what informs uh, how I see the world and how I, I formulate my ideas about that. So it informs the way I write, it informs the way I take pictures today. So that's just sort of going back a little bit. Then in the year 2000, um, I met my husband, a few years before that, and he is the person who uh, was born and raised in Canada. He has some Hungarian origins, but um, he was born and raised in Canada, and he was in graduate school in the United States. So when we decided to get married in 2000, then I moved to the United States for, for that reason. And then in the beginning, we lived in Colorado for a year and a half. And this is the place where I started learning Spanish. And I'm mentioning all of these languages because again, languages and communication and being able to communicate with people in their own language, that's something that has very much informs the way that I think. Uh, So we moved to Colorado, we lived there for a year and a half. Um, Then we moved to New York, to Long Island. uh, And this is where I've been uh, living since then. And I have two children, so for, a Good number of years, actually, after moving to the U.S., I was sort of like a stay home, I would say that. So I I didn't have a job outside of the house. I was raising my children. This was something that was very, very important for me. And it was very important for me to raise them with this knowledge of many different cultures, right? I mean, obviously, they are straddling two cultures already because, because of my Hungarian background as an immigrant coming to the U.S., um, somebody who, I mean, I could speak English already well when I came here, but still, it's, it's not the same. You have to still adjust to the language, to the culture, to everything. So they were struggling to cultures, and it was something very important for me to, to teach them Hungarian, to teach them their background. But I, I want to put like just one sentence in here, because a lot of people think that teaching children or teaching immigrants about their backgrounds, it's really important because of tradition, right? So again, this idea of tradition and how tradition is seen from the North American perspective, and that is not my motivation, right? So my motivation was not focusing on my tradition. It simply was that that's that's the language that I speak the best. That's the language that I'm most comfortable with. Um, that's, That's the language that I know songs and stories in, right? So in a way, the folkloric culture, and that's the language that if we go and visit my country, that they can communicate and they can be part of, of that scene. So that, that was sort of that. And then since so my children were growing, I realized um, I would, of course, want to think about the future. I started auditing a lot of courses here at the university uh, in Stony Brook. 
um, I can speak Spanish. So then, you know, I audited a lot of Spanish courses. I was thinking of maybe going that direction. And then I was also thinking of going to social work. But one of the, um, the obstacles I faced in, this, in, in, in the U.S. context actually was that the university didn't seem to be willing to, to recognize my law degree, even as an undergraduate, because they said that this is just not, because I didn't want to continue studying law, they said my credits, right, like what they considered the credits were irrelevant. So social work, the School of Social Work at Stony Brook, they specifically said they wouldn't recognize that. So I would have to start with an undergrad and then keep going. So that was sort of like a bummer. And that was not really what my plan was. Um, and then by chance, I audited or not by chance, I chose that. But by chance, I sort of happened on one of the courses at Africana Studies, which was about African history, modern African history. And I audited that course and I absolutely fell in love with that. And the reason that I fell in love with that be was because um, it was not taught from a political perspective, right? So it was, it was taught by a person who, who's from Ethiopia and, and um, it was really history. And it was, it was a part of world history, which I didn't really know anything about. Right. Because, again, coming from my background, that's not something, of course, you learn history classes and there are there's some sort of general knowledge of African history. But the details, the, you know, just just the richness of that and how that connects to to Atlantic history, to North American history, to European history, sort of the connections really fascinated me. So I went and talked to the chair of the department at the time, who was the chair of the department at the time. I explained my situation and I told him I would love to start doing a graduate degree in African studies, but here's the situation, right? Like my law degree is not recognized by the university as an undergrad. Is there anything we can do something about that? And he said, yes, absolutely. So he was willing um, to give me a chance. And he said, I want to see some of your writing. I want to see essays that you wrote. You know, I, I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more. And then if if that's fine, I'm not going like, I, I, yes, we will, you know, so they, they could waive that. That was the point. So that's how I got to Africana Studies. And then in Africana Studies, um, what was very interesting to me, um, it, right from, so, okay, let, let me just backtrack a little bit. And Jen knows this because we had this conversation before. So that sounds sort of like, going in my mind, where should I go? So I went into Africana studies, completely naive of all the, the political implications of the field. I knew absolutely nothing about that. I didn't go to school in the US, right? So I had no knowledge of that. The first encounter I had with Africana studies was through that African course, which had nothing to do with, with American politics. So I went into this very naively, this whole racial identity war and this whole racial identity focus was not something that I knew. But of course, once I was admitted to, to the program and then I met all of the other students and professors, this was something that I, I really, uh, I had to face. Like I had to face that and, and sort of reckon with that and, and how, how do I place myself within this context, right? Like, and that was sort of the moment which a lot of people describe who, who come to this country as immigrants, that from a person, from a, pers from a private person or an individual of who you are, you suddenly become a category, right? So that, that was the moment really for me to become white and not white, of course, in the descriptive sense, but white in the political sense of that. So that was, that was the, the context I had to navigate. And my main interest doing my, my graduate research, my main interest was, um, it was focused on the Caribbean and, and it came from this sort of, uh, this, this curiosity of how the way, you know, how, how belief systems that we have, and in that belief systems, I don't just mean religion, right? Spirituality, religion, so any kind of beliefs, it can be a secular belief system, right? So how belief systems, interact with our reality, how belief systems 
shape the way we see the world. And not simply how we see the world, but also how we experience the world, right? So how's the, like, if, if we have a specific type of explanation for the world, of course, it's going to influence the type of experiences that we have. So that was sort of the wider umbrella, which, um, in which I came to study the Caribbean. And then simply because I was fascinated really by the merger, the, the cultural and the religious merger of, of the Caribbean and how it represents to me very much then the, very different from how cultural merger is seen from the United States, right? So the Caribbean really is a merger of all of the three continents. And that's a very beautiful thing. It's, it's a very, to me, that's a truly progressive thing. So that's the way I see progress, right? When you can, when you can integrate everything that has belonged to your history, you can pick and choose for yourself which of that you actually want to integrate. So anyway, um, this is how I, I arrived to Haiti because I wanted to study the religious aspect of that. So how religion and politics interact with each other and um, and that was my that was my master's thesis. So so the, the interaction of the political rhetoric and the interaction of of um, religious beliefs, re religious rhetoric, religious imagery, and how that that played out in in, in Haitian political context. Um, any questions, or should I continue? <laughs> well, it, is you have a, said a lot already. I know that's why I'm asking. Like, I don't want to just go off on this like long thing, but I haven't gotten to the teaching part yet. But maybe, maybe let's just take a break and then. Yeah, um, I, I I look forward to the rest of this. Trust me, I'm enjoying this right now. But I just, for the sake of my ability to remember what you said, I think we need to uh, stop now and talk. Jennifer, do you agree? Can we stop now and yeah. ask some questions? Absolutely, please. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, my. Three main questions revolve around your experience in Israel, um, your idea of progress and integration, which you just said, which I'm very interested in. I might save that for last. And you're uh, the professor of Africana Studies who um, allowed you to enter into this program. And the fact that uh, he or she, I don't, I forget. He, uh, it, was, it was a male. That, the fact that he didn't warn you about the politics uh, of American higher education, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, Africana studies, uh, other kinds of uh, studies of marginalized groups and things like that, categories, you know, the uh, importance of identity when it comes to all that stuff. Like, he, he was just like, hey, there it is. Go right in there. There's nothing wrong with that room, and it's on fire. You know, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know why he wouldn't mention <laughs> that. Uh, did you ever wonder that? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. And to be honest with you, I, I'm really glad he didn't because that would already have set me on a specific path. Okay. Uh, and this, this way he didn't. And, um, also just to continue the story about him and, and me. So he became one of my main, uh, thesis advisors. This is a professor, a wonderful professor. I have to say he already retired. Um, I was his last graduate student, so, but he's from Barbados. So I think, so he, he probably has a different understanding of these things. And, um, yeah, that's, I think is an important part of the story. So I'll, 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 I will tell you that. So once we started working on my, my thesis project in the, let's say the last year and a half. And by that point, also, I, I was doing the degree part time. So it took me longer than just two years. So I had a lot of experience with all of this, what you're saying, the politics and all of that. Oh. Um, and of course, that was something that I, I started talking to him about because, you know, I mean, the baseline approach, this default approach of like, me wanting to study the Caribbean, right? Like, and then again, this, this very racialized context of, of Haiti which is seen as the black country, the black republic, the black history, although it's a different black history than, than North American black history. So, and I could see the resistance, I could see from, from, from other students, that's what I mean. Um, and I could sort of anticipate, right? This, the, the criticism of like, who are you even to, to, to go there, right? Like, who are you even to talk about that? 
And and before I really went into to writing the thesis, I, I sat down with, with this professor um, and I was talking to him about that. And I said, you know, maybe I should do something else because um, it, it's just like the way authenticity is 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 seen or is framed in, in the North American context, there's no way I can overcome that obstacle, obviously. And he had a very, very good conversation and he was the one who actually encouraged me to continue and do this. And I think I said that to Jen defer during the first conversation, but it's, it, it was really important for me because he said, Ilya, no, trust me, I really know what you're talking about. And I understand the kind of resistance that you feel from, from particular students, especially, but some, some faculty as well. Um, but he said, all I can tell you, we in the Americas, we have a histor historical baggage. And that historical baggage, it's not that it's not valid, but that historical baggage prevents us from seeing a lot of things that you coming from Eastern Europe you're absolutely able to see. And I want you to continue and I want you to say the things that you see. Now I have to warn you. So this is the point where he was warning me. So he said, I also have to warn you, there will be a lot of people who will not want to hear what you have to say because it goes against their baggage. But he, and that's what he told me. I remember this to this day because it was just such, um, like he's the reason that I'm, I'm you know, I even continued and, and I am where I am today. He said, that's the noise and you have to be able to work basically beyond that noise, overcoming that noise. He said, don't worry about the noise. And that was hugely empowering because also like, think about it. I'm like a, whatever, like second year, third year um, graduate student. And there are all these like scholars and the papers. So sort of like, I'm dealing with all of that, how to digest this, like, who am I in this field? Like, what my opinions and, and, and voice, if you want to use that word, like, what does it count? What does it matter? And he, 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 he was the one who told me, no, like, you're not less smart than any one of those who have like 25 million publications behind them. Um, so maybe, I don't know how much that answers your question. No, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a good answer. I, um, I, I'm glad that he, he did that and, and told you those things. I'm I'm just wondering how much uh, top-down support you had um, as a now white person, no longer Hungarian, now white person, uh, in an Africana studies program. Um, yes, a lot of people are going to look at you and think you have no ethos when it comes to speaking about these things, but that does shut down, you know, the the conversation of humankind, as it's been called, right? Uh, the constitution of knowledge, as it's been called. What I'm trying to say is your voice is part of the experience. Your voice is a viewpoint that other people would do well to know, right? Not because it's the authority, but because it's another viewpoint, an angle that they don't have. Yes, exactly. Academics are supposed to acknowledge that and <laughs> embrace that. Um, and nowadays it doesn't seem to be happening as much, which means to me that it's not really academia, but that's my issue. We can talk about that some other time. Um, but it, 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 it does seem like uh, still, although he said he supports you, how much support did you have otherwise? Um, so Stony Brook is a very small, Afri has a small African studies department. Okay. And at the time that I was there as a graduate student, I, I mean, he was the chair. He was a very um, honored professor at the department. So uh, again, like, I think the fact that he supported me and also there was another professor, a senior professor, he, he, he's Haitian, he's still there, he's Haitian. And he also supported me. So, so the support of those two people who you want, who if you want to look at it that way are as authentic as can be right, about the topic that I'm, I'm researching, that mattered a lot. So, so in, within that context and during my student years, I got a lot of support from those two professors and that's, that, that was enough. That really was enough. Okay. So I, I know what you're talking about and I do see that and it's not that I, I, I don't, but I personally 
did not experience that during my um, graduate years. Okay. Um, later on, when th there was a different chair, and then I, I actually wasn't associated with the, the department for, for a few years, um, I, it might have been different if I were there at the time. I don't know that because I wasn't there, but I think I got very lucky with, with the, the particular two people that supported me. Okay, excellent. Uh, Jane, do you have anything to ask or say? Before well, I you had a talking? couple more questions, so I don't want to get you off, but I, I'm interested But what both of you think, Ildi and, and you too, Eric, Correct me if I'm wrong, Ildi, I understood that these two professors that were most supportive of you were themselves immigrants. Did, is that true? Yes, that's true. That's correct. And I'm just wondering yeah, if so that, my, do you my, think that... Go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to reiterate that my main thesis advisor is from Barbados and the sort of... It, I mean, there were two thesis advisors, one of them from Barbados, the other one from Haiti. Okay. Uh, let me follow up with the immigrant status of your professors. Um, and I, because, for example, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll preface my question with this. Um, the One of the fastest rising immigrant groups in America are West African, Caribbean, um, black people, right? Uh, which kind of throws a monkey wrench into the whole, you know, oppressor oppressed ideology we keep bumping up against. Um, in, in various uh, academic contexts. And I'm wondering if your, uh, the, the immigrant status of your advisors uh, uh, influenced your experience because of that. Perhaps they were a little bit uh, more, for lack of a better term, I guess, optimistic about the American experience uh, than um, African descendants of slaves, uh, as it were. So I, 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 I'm wondering if, if that's the case here. You said earlier that basically progress is integration, right? Or integration is mm -hmm. progress. Um, and you were, I think you were talking about the fact that there's so many different cultural influences going on here. And um, if we could just see that as a whole somehow, then that would, you know, uh, move us in the right direction, right? Progress us toward a, a, um, a, a better ability, I guess, to, to live together and, and, and get along. Um, so I don't know what my question is anymore. I'm just talking right now. <laughs> um, but I, I think there's a distinction between uh, you know, your professors, your, your, your advisors, immigrant status, and the um, attitude that's being projected onto anyway, uh, African descendants of slaves. So I, I'm wondering if that's the case. Um, but I don't really want to speak for them in their name, yeah. but the way so, and I don't think it's so much the immigrant status. It's a lot more simply the culture, right? So you can call this immigrant status, but they simply grew up knowing a different culture, right? Experiencing a different culture, experiencing different lifestyles. Um, so I think they were somehow as much as, I'm, I'm just trying, thinking how to phrase that, but as much as um, I don't think that they would um, completely um, go against or deny, let's say, the, the, the sort of the mainstream narrative of African studies, that I mean, the political narrative of African studies, they do, and, and that's what I saw also with, with my professor the, from Barbados. He, he very much understood the need, as you described, for simply different perspectives. So again, not making this hierarchy of, of who's more of, more of an authority than the other person, but I think he simply really took the idea of inclusivity, right, using the jargon, seriously, but inclusivity meaning mutual inclusivity. Right? So it's not like now suddenly I'm the one who can speak and you shut up. It was right. a lot more like, no, we all need to be able to speak and, and actually truly hear each other. Right. So whether that was influenced by his, his, his background, his immigrant background, or simply it's just his nature, his character as a person, right? That he says, you know, there's something wrong about not wanting to 
hear other opinions. I'm, I don't know, maybe it's the two together, right? Um, and there was something else which now I forgot I wanted to mention. But I, uh, I did mention the uh, relationship between <laughs> progress and integration. And integration, yes, that's correct, yes. So, okay, so here with integration, I would want to be careful because a lot of people will hear this and, and interpret what we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say, integration is being losing your original culture using losing your and and that's not what i mean by integration so when i use the word integration in the context of the caribbean i sort of me meant an ability to merge the cultures right so an ability to inability to sort of go to a different level to go beyond in a way to see okay here's the here's the terrain we have all of these different elements in this terrain, cultural elements, religious elements in the terrain. So how do we go to a higher ground and how do we construct something new using all of those elements? So in, in, in my mind, progress and integration in this sense is not about rejection. It's about, it's about being able to merge and then, and then use it and reuse it, rebuild something to create something new. That's, I think that's what I meant by integration. Well, that's definitely what I mean by integration, but I, I, I understand what you're talking about. A lot of people, the idea that integration means you're gaining one thing, you have to lose something else is a, unfortunately, a, a, a trope within a certain uh, uh, narrative about social justice, uh, especially yes. one uh, that's um, in the whole anti-racist social justice uh, kind yes. of thing. If I learn standard English, I'm going to lose my ability to speak black English. That's a load of crap. Yeah, you know? no, of course. And it doesn't It doesn't also mean that you're losing sort of that side of your personality, right? Of course, you're right. not losing that. You're adding something to it. Precisely. Precisely. And yeah, but, but, but see, that's also why I think that the Caribbean, in that sense, is such a good example. And later on, when we go into my teaching, um, I can talk about that because that's what I, that, that was the foundation for the whole course that I built to see this, right? Like to see that integration doesn't actually mean you're losing something in your, of yourself. Right. It means, and I, I, I didn't use the word integration when I was teaching the course, but that it doesn't matter which word we use, right? Like we know what we mean by that. So the Caribbean is the prime example of that. And, um, and that's the other thing, right? Like how we understand Caribbean history and how we understand Caribbean uh, art and culture, again, is very much influenced by the North American perspective, the North American cultural framework. And then, you know, that already changes, but that's like the whole different topic. And that was, that, that was sort of my other article for the Journal of Free Black Thought, <laughs> which I wrote about Cuban music and, you know, how, how Cuban culture and Cuban um, Cuban art is viewed from the United States, and how does it look when you actually look at it from Cuba? Okay. Well, I mean, you 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 mentioned the teaching thing. Let's talk about it. You know, um, you. how does all this come out in the classroom for you? So um, it came out really well for this this semester, I have to say. So this was an adjunct position, and this sort of a little bit connects to what you were saying about West Africans and, and, and the, the Caribbean immigrants who come here. Because right now, so the African Studies in Stony Brook, uh, the chair of the department is a person of, of, from West Africa, from Cameroon, I believe. And, and he was the one who, he, he's been trying to, to get me to teach at the department, but because I'm, I'm not looking to have a full-time position there. So, you know, we were trying to find ways how that would be possible. And then, then uh, in the spring, this opportunity came up. There was one course which they had nobody to teach the course. And so he said, would you like to do this as an adjunct? And I said, what's the course? <laughs> I think Jen already knows. So they told me, well, it's themes in the black experience. <laughs> so I know. So um, then I looked up the official description of what the course is supposed to be about, which, as you can imagine, is is supposed to be about, or so that's that's what the university thing says. It's supposed to be about the Black American experience, 
And just from judging from the description, it was very obvious you need to teach that from a specific perspective. So in the beginning, I said, well, maybe it's better if I, if we wait for a different course for me to come up, because it's really, I mean, my, my expertise or my area is, is the Caribbean. It's not so much North America. Um, I mean, also I thought again, honestly, like being aware of everything that has happened over the past five years, like, can you imagine, I, I like, it's like Toni Morrison says, it's not only black people who are being racialized, everybody's being racialized, right? Um, so me walking into this classroom, nobody's going to see me, nobody's going to see a Hungarian person, and they definitely will not know what that means, right? And that's another sort of conversation the sort of the fallacy of the idea that North American students actually know European history because that's what they were taught. I mean, they absolutely don't know European history. I can say that. Um, but anyway, so in the beginning, I said, I think maybe we should wait for a different course. And then um, the current chair told me, Gildi, I think you should take this. And he knows, so another thing about him, he knows my work. So he's somebody who um, actually put an exhibit at the department about my Haitian pictures. Uh, he asked me to give a, give, give a talk. So it's not like he's, he's unfamiliar with the approach that I have. And he said, whatever is written in the official sort of curriculum suggestion, you can disregard that. This is your course. So if you want to build this course from scratch and absolutely do your thing, I invite you to do that. So I started thinking and I said, okay, that sounds really good, but I still wanted to be sure that we are on the same page. So I gave him a short description, sort of like an outline of how I would teach the course, which, would, which, which was um, a comparative historical and social study, right? Like, uh, yeah, historical social study of Cuba, of Haiti, and the United States. So how, do, what we call, or what the United States, in the United States is described as the Black experience, how did that play out in Cuba? How did that play out in Haiti and in the United States, and how they compare? And I sort of um, built the course around works of art. So one of the goals was to move away from this obsession that in humanities, right, we need to always look at th things through social analysis. And again, this comes back to the categorization, this need to, to definitions and how we define. So, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, how, you know, like this, this sort of the scientific approach, how does that map onto real life and human life? and human psychology and all of that, so the humanities, and where it's useful and where it's not, maybe such a useful way to, to talk about it. Um, but I very much feel that in, in the current US public conversation, like art, just art for the sake of art itself and how life, human life, not academic life and not theory and not all of that, but life as it happens on the ground, how that, um, how that can be seen and how, how that presents itself in art, right? So literature, music, visual art, um, you know, I had them read novels for, for each country. Um, we listen to music. I mean, there is a little bit different focus depending on the context because in Haiti, I think what was very useful was to, to focus on besides history, to focus on mythology and religion and spirituality, because that is a very strong part of, of, of that culture. In Cuba, um, I mean, Cuba is really interesting in and of itself, right, in the context of the Caribbean. Um, you know, like how, how ideas of, of independence, liberty, revolution, how that played out, you know, like how that played out independence from Spain, independence from colonialism, then, you know, comes the dictatorship, then comes Fidel Castro, and then comes another dictatorship, how that relates to Eastern European history or certain African histories where there was also socialist dictatorship. So what I really wanted to, the students to be able to do is to see history much more as a flow, right? Like as a flow and, and as an interconnected thing rather than just simply obsess over 
what you know we see as the black experience in isolation. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm still speaking a lot, so please ask. No, it's just that that's the whole point. You're the one being interviewed. We're just asking questions <laughs> to you know give you an excuse to do exactly what you're doing. So thank you very much. I like the fact that you uh, point out the uh, erroneous idea of the black experience. Right, uh, there is no single black experience, uh, not even in one group. There's no single black Cuban experience. There's no, yeah, exactly. you know, uh, single black Haitian. There's no single black experience in the same family, let alone the same, uh, you know, country or region or something like that. Nevertheless, that is a common idea uh, in the United States these days. And I think it's because, well, it's because of a lot of things, but what it really speaks to is the fact that we look at "Quote unquote blackness," from um, as as if it they it shares a uh, universal discourse. What I mean by that is there's a universal set of values, attitudes, and beliefs, and ways of speaking and dressing and things like that that all are uh, all constitute the black experience, which is not the case at all. You go mm-hmm. to different cultures, you have different values, attitudes, beliefs, um, you know. Uh, uh, interpretations of dialects, what they mean, how they're valued and things like that. All those things differ. Why is it so hard for people to wrap their minds around that? Yeah, that was a question. Yeah. Yeah, that was a question. Why is it so hard? <laughs> yes. Um, don't ask me because I don't think it's hard to wrap your mind around <laughs> yeah. that, right? But so Neither do I. Okay, so I'm trying to think based on the, the reaction that I got in class from the students. Um, first of all, let me, let me put this forward. So it was not very hard for them to wrap their minds around that for, for the majority of them, but it was certainly something that they have not really ever really thought about before or were encouraged to think about before. Um, so that was one of the the reactions that, that I, I received from them and I mean, no, I, I, I'm just thinking like how to put this because like they were really, so, okay. So they were really, really grateful for the fact that I didn't teach them what to think or what to say. And they, and they said that, like, I mean, they told me things like you're the first professor who actually is interested in knowing what we think. Now that's sort of, I know. I mean, it's like in one, on the one hand, it's shocking. On the other hand, it wasn't that shocking, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, my daughter just finished high school. So, you know, and my son is in high school. So I know how the education system works. Now, this is not to say that all schools are like that. And again, to be fair to my daughter's high school, it's a wonderful high school out of here on Long Island. But still, it wasn't sort of, it wasn't a complete surprise to me that they said that. But the the good sign was that they were open. They were really appreciative. They said, we, we want this. We want to, to hear different opinions and we want to be able to explore different opinions. Now, this, this is a large class or a relatively large class for a seminar class. I had 46 students and I think, yeah, it was large. And the seminar. Well, not seminar, but sort of, it's not like this lecture where there are 300 students, right? So to me, yeah. this is, it, it was a class where I wanted them to interact. It was not just me standing there and like talking. It, I wanted them to interact. So for that four to six is that's, that's a lot of people, that's a yeah. lot of students. And the background was very different. So um, in the best way, I think we had di- like real diversity. So not just color diversity, but diversity in, in different backgrounds and diversity of majors. So this was a freshman class. Um, most of the students were, were freshmen, not all of them, let's say about like 70%. Um, and they came from all different majors and many of them came from, from natural sciences. And again, they will think very differently. The, the, the nature of information that they might have even about these topics is going to be very different. So if I want to be very provocative, the level of indoctrination will be different for like a first year physics students or a second year physics students and for a third year gender studies students, right? So, so that was very good. It really, I think it helped my job in that way, uh, in that sense. The other thing, okay, yeah, just to answer your question, how, why they can't wrap their minds around this. 
I think they really can. Like there was a young woman who was of Nigerian origins, but I think she mostly grew up here. I'm not sure how old she was when she came here. And she could absolutely and fully see. And she knew, I mean, she was one of the ones who participated most in my class. And she was very open about how things are different and seen differently in Nigeria or even in her community here. But then the answer is always like, well, but in the US, right? Like, well, but considering US history. So then suddenly they just go into this, again, because that's what they are taught. That's what they have heard. In a way, that's the, that's the type of knowledge that they have. So we had to sort of start unpacking that and, 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 you know, and involve students in the discussion and then make them comfortable enough to speak, which again, sounds in a way surreal that I even have to say this, but, but the truth is it does take a while. And, and by the last class, there was, there was a student who, who like very clearly said, you know, there are so many, there, there's so much talk about safe spaces and, you know, everybody should be safe and all of that. But the truth is even having gone through high school, none of these spaces are safe because if I say something that that is not the majority opinion, I'm going to be like just taken to pieces. And mm -hmm. he told me your class is the first place where I feel safe. And again, so, so, so this, these are sort of the reactions that I got. And then I'll, I'll let you ask a question. There was just one more thing that came to my mind. Oh, Jen is gone, I think. Is Jen gone? Uh, I'm she sure she'll be back. Okay. And that was um, because there were several students who came from Latin American backgrounds, right? Central American, Latin American backgrounds. Um, and who, again, it was obvious that they were not born in the U.S., but they have been to school in the U.S. So they sort of had like a, a, a sort of a double a cultural experience. And for them to learn about Cuba and to learn about the Cuban experience and sort of open that up and say, this is not simply black or white or, or whatever, but this is, this is the experience of, of so, so we read a short story which plays, uh, which is set on a farm, like in a small village in a farm before the revolution, the Castro revolution, and then after that. So it follows the life of this woman who builds a farm to herself, like a, a village woman. And, and the point, I don't want to go into the, very much the details, but the point is like a lot of the students could very much relate to those kinds of the thoughts, the ideas, the value systems that, uh, that the author, Reynaldo Arenas, he describes in the short story. And they, you know, they chose to write their papers on that. So there was something for them to connect. And again, do we see this as a person of color experience? Do we see this as, you know, as, as a village experience? Do we see this as the experience of somebody who, who had to deal with, you know, one dictatorship after another? So what kind of experience is that? And I think for them to, to be able to make those connections, I, the reactions were very positive. That's that's what I can say. Okay, well that's good. That's good. Yeah, um, yeah. You 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 mentioned uh, you know your your student of Nigerian descent. Yes. Talking about the differences between you know the experience in West Africa and the experience in the United States. Did any students? Uh, any African American students, do, uh, descendants of slaves, uh, uh, did, did they make any kind of comparison as well? Were they like, well, that's the way it is here, but here it's different, or there rather, but here it's different? You know, was that the case? Yes, and it was not only the African American students. It was a lot of students in the beginning. So, sort of, I, I just didn't want to go into like a very long yeah. story about the course, but. Okay. Um, Okay, let me, let me just mention this. So we started, because one of the other things that I introduced to them, the context to this whole conversation is again, you know, social media, um, news media, how that influences the information that we have, how that influences our knowledge. So it's sort of like, I, I, I framed it within that. I wanted them to explore that a little bit, you know, like the documentary, yeah. uh, the social dilemma and all of that. So, because if we don't know, if we don't know how we are being manipulated in a way, even if it's not like a conscious manipulation by one person, but just how the whole 
store economy around us manipulates the way we know things, right? Then, then how are we even talking about these experiences? So that was sort of the wider umbrella I put it um, in. And then in the beginning, I gave them three sentences. And I, ju I just said, just tell me whether you think these sentences are facts or opinions. And the three sentences were, the story of black people in the Americas is a story of, and then number one was slavery and suffering. Number two was resistance, resilience, and faith. And number three was a human story. And I just said, we don't need to decide whether which one is right or wrong. Just tell me whether these are facts or opinions. And then they had, to, and they started discussing that. And, you know, of course, when you start thinking about this, then suddenly you're like, yeah, right. Like, is this a fact or is it an opinion? Because if you go through that, I mean, all of those are facts in a way, right? So where's the line where these facts turn into opinions? And what is it that makes them turn into opinions rather than facts? So where's the overlap, right? And where's the separation? And that was a very useful exercise for the whole thing because, and, and just to answer your question and how this connects to your question. So yes, a lot of the, the, the American students, not just African-American, but white American students, in fact, said that to say that the story of black people in the Americas is a human story is denigrating the African-American experience. So I said, okay, that's fine. And that, that was also like, I didn't want to argue about this. I didn't, I just wanted to let it sit there and then have everybody essay. And then there was just this silence. And I said, because there are so few students speaking at the time. And I told them, if nobody's going to speak, I will call some names because I really would like you to give your opinion. There's no wrong or right opinion here. And then I called like randomly. This in the beginning, I didn't really know them. I called um, a female name from the list and it turned out she was a young woman of Haitian descent. And she was telling me, well, you know, I don't think that to say that the story of, of black people in the Americas is a human story is in any way denigrating. He said, she said, it's a fact. And, and, and then we had this whole, but, but that was, so I think that really answers the question that North American students are, I think are socialized into thinking this, right? That to even mention that this is a human experience somehow will denigrate. So there is a hierarchy. There needs to be a hierarchy. And that's the kind of socialization, I think, which is present in the educational system. And that really interestingly came out from this interaction, right? Like the American students tells me, oh no, you can't say that, or you can say that, but then you're denigrating our experience. And then the Haitian woman says, um, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And again, that just gives you the different cultural perspectives. Okay. Good. It sounds like you were able to have, you know, a lot of uh, robust and civil conversations in that class around these issues. And that's wonderful, given the fact that uh, that's not always how they play out. You know, uh, things can get a little contentious at times. So it, Yes, I yeah. know that. And, and I was very worried about that, I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe I got lucky with the students I had. Um, I mean, I'm not saying there was no resistance. So there was one African-American student who, you know, I could see from his responses and all that, that he was very much inundated with, you know, this, these ideas um, like identity and all that, and that it has to be the essence of who you are. I mean, he spent many classes just on his computer fact-checking me all the time. So he did that and, and that was fine. You know, you want to do that, then, then do that, right? Like anything I say, I can back up. And the other point of the class was really, I didn't want them to feel that I'm teaching them or what I'm saying is important in any way. So almost all of the classes I presented voices, voices from the black, like you, like you actually, you were a part of the class. So I have to say that, but you know, voices like Glenn Lowry, voices like, like John McWhorter, like um, Coleman Hughes, Shelby Steele, Sheena Mason, Carlos Hoyt, like all of these people who are part of the black community. And that's why I told the students, I don't expect any of you to agree with them or disagree with them or do, but you have to somehow relate to it. Like we can't just simply ignore this and say, you know, this is non-existent or these people are, and then you put the label, 
right? Because there was one student who came to me after we, we listened to an interview with John McWhorter, <coughs> excuse me. So she came next class and she says, you know, I researched him and I really love his ideas. She was an African student and I love his ideas, but I don't really understand this. He, he seems to be working for the Manhattan Institute because I think she found some information about John McWhorter really being associated with the Manhattan Institute. And she tells me that's a conservative think tank. And that's sort of like, again, so that's, that's, that's what they are socialized to believe, right? Like you put a label on someone, which in this case was conservative or working for a conservative think tank. And then this, that disqualifies what you're saying. Right. So I think in that sense, yes, I feel that I was successful <clears throat> by the end of the, the course to make them realize that we, we can't do it. Like this is not leading anywhere. And, and for that, it was very useful to not start with the United States, but start in Haiti, which is really the, again, thinking by the identity terms, the blackest of, you know, of the, the, the Atlantic region. So you start with Haiti. Then you go to Cuba, right? And then you evaluate all of these things in those contexts. You look at literature, you look at art, and then you go to the United States, and then you go to current conversations, current political conversations. Okay. Yeah, I don't think Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got, you're just kind of you're pulling all this together, Ildi. You're about ready to, to launch a book. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that before we let okay. you go? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, I am getting ready. So this is a short story collection. Um, and part of the stories will be set in Haiti, uh, current like contemporary Haiti. And part of the stories will be set in Hungary, um, sort of mid 20th century, early 20th century Hungary. And what will connect the stories some of them fiction, some of nonfiction, right? So I'm now that I'm sort of editing, doing the, the final editing here, and I'm writing the last story, which I wanted to include. I'm also pulling this together for myself, right? So part of, so this is going to be a merger, a true hybrid. Part of it is fiction. Part of it is sort of based or inspired by mythology, inspired by belief, but part of it is, is just real history and facts, right? So that's very much nonfiction. It's going to be set in, in, in context, which is nonfiction at all. So part of them, okay, Haiti and Hungary, and what connects them are the themes. So it's displacement, loss, motherhood, mm -hmm. um, resilience, struggle. In a way, a lot of the things that we, or the, the, I don't mean we, but the North American public conversation associates with blackness, Mm -hmm. And how that sort of moves in human history again. So it's it's sort of it, it's making the connection, finding the flow, not not looking at any specific context in isolation. And just one word about that, you know, connected to the book, like this type of um, of attitude of looking at the word, right? Of, of sort of like thinking that our history is just so unique and and nothing compares to that and. We have been victims of this and that. Um, it's, it's not simply a North American black idea, right? I mean, Hungarian conservatives, nationalists have been doing this for <laughs> hundreds of years. So, so for me, that was also something very interesting to see. And it sort of goes a little bit back to when you were asking me about progress or what progressivism means. Mm -hmm. it, it's, um, it's, it's really, I don't want to use the word shocking. I only use like two strong words, but it's very surprising, right? Like how what's conceived to be progressive here, this sort of nativist idea of, of who we are and, and how we should, you know, sort of structure groups around that and identities around that. That's, that's exactly what the nationalist right used to be in the Eastern European or even the wider European context. And this is when it comes back to, I said, I mean, American students don't know European history. Maybe they think they know, and maybe they know some of British history, but, but they, they definitely don't know European history. And that was also one, and I will finish, I know you guys have to go, but that was a very important aspect, like some of the conversations in class when 
because I asked them to read the article which I wrote in Free Black Thought about Haiti and Hungary. And I asked them for their feedback. So what did you think about it? And, and then we got to this point of like, okay, what is actually black history and white history? And is Eastern European history white history? And they mm -hmm. said, well, yes, no. So, you know, suddenly it's like they have to think about it. What does that adjective really mean there? Like, does that mean just a sort of a descriptive color or does that mean something else? And then there was the student who said, no, no, it's not really white history. And I said, so, okay, how can I be white by your standards, but then not have a white history? So how do we, you know, like, and then of course the same can apply to Cuba. Like, is it black history, but then how do you, squared that with the communism. So it, it, it's, it's again, these, the different flows and the different, the complexities of all of that. So that's what I'm hoping that the book will somehow convey and be about. I'm almost done with the manuscript. I'm hoping to be done with the manuscript by the end of February. And I do not have a publisher yet. So that's going to be the next <laughs> difficult. Yes, that's going to be the next part, finding a publisher. Sylvie, I wanted to tell you something in regards to integration, and maybe perhaps we end on this, but this is why it was so important for me to get Eric as, as the co-host here, is what you are talking about in your book, and you're not, you, you are looking at human experiences, and I think this is, Eric, what you often call discourses, right? So you're looking at things like, you know, love and loss and not just identity, and so you're looking at the discourses within these human experiences, and integrating that. And that's what attracts me. Well, let me stop there and say, Eric, do, do, am I making sense? Do you see where like your idea of discourses kind of matches with where Ildi's going in the book? Well, the social linguistic concept of, of discourse is really about the framework we use to interpret the world, right? Mm. So you have certain, you know, values and beliefs and histories uh, that, you know, through which you look at the world and interpret the, the same thing I'm looking at differently than I do because I have a different set of values and beliefs and, and things like that. Is that where you're going? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the, and that and just to say these, I'm so excited about the stories from both Hungary and Haiti, but making that connection that there's still that, that the commonality there. There is still a discourse to be had over like mm -hmm. common human experiences versus yes. identities. Yes. And for me, Ilde, I want to say, like what so attracted me is as someone who studied, I love that your history of studying languages and how it's so important to be able to communicate in native languages. I mean, that's my, my background is international relations. My background is that kind of integration of those human experiences as well. And that's where I've, I think I see a lot of what we're seeing in uh, the discourse, if you will, around race in America is that disconnect of that common human experience. And that's. Or the notion that if you make that connect or sort of make or recognize that common human experience, then you somehow diminish other experiences. Right. And right. I, I just right. don't believe that that stands like this is not like a zero sum game. Right. And right. just going back like with one sentence to the article. And if, I would recommend people to read that, the article in Free Black Thought about this connection between Hungary and Haiti. Like the assumption when I move to this country or when people see me in this country will be that, again, because you become the white person, that you're just naturally going to feel at home here. Like, how could it be different, right? And, and I, I was telling Jan, like when I went to Haiti, and I started going there and I started living the experiences, you know, and, and photographing there and not living in hotels, not living in fancy places, not living where typically, you know, the whatever the nonprofit people live, but really staying with my coworker and then just going from place to place. I felt absolutely at home, like that system, the kind of system that exists, which is sort of, you know, in many ways chaotic, you know, it comes out of, of you know, of, of, of political oppression, of dictatorship, and then what comes in the aftermath of that, where simply the rule of law does not really apply as it applies in the United States, when 
when you you don't have entitlements, you don't have rights, like those, the notion even is not many times there. And then you have to deal with material poverty and all of that. Like that's really the history of Eastern Europe. So to me, to know how to instinctively work in a system like that and how to met, find my way in a system like that, that to me came very naturally. I had no problem. I had a lot more sort of, not problem, but, but the, I, I never felt at home in the United States in that sense. This is a structured system that's, that's centered around consumer society, right? Like shopping malls, whatever. So everything is a product. Knowledge is a product here. Um, but again, this is a whole different discussion, but I just wanted to sort of close with that, 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 yes, I mean, there are similar human experiences and in my, and I think that in many ways, my experience and the experience of my family going back has a lot more in common as a personal individual experience with, with many people in Haiti than it has with people who grew up in the United States. And that has nothing to do with my skin color. We will be sure okay. to put in a link to your articles in Free Black Thought in the show notes. So if anyone's looking for that, look down in the show notes. And thank you, Ildi. Maybe this will be, there's so much more to talk about. So maybe this will be part one of a series. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And thank you, Eric, for co-hosting this. I would love to hear at some point what, what what's your take on this. Oh, sure. Uh, I would love to do that. So... We'll find so the part, time. Yes. Part two may be coming up sooner rather than later. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.